huge proportion of those that eventually falling into the fail bucket and it's tick 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 we've done everything that we needed to do we can close the project and then off we go um and that's where it falls over welcome to process pioneers the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers key influencers and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process Welcome to the next episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers. And in each of these episodes, I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with uh, industry experts and specialists uh, on all areas when it comes to business process management and and every other complementary topic as well. It's a very uh, broad pod- podcast. A uh, podcast uh, we've got going here. And uh, if you are joining us for the first time, a warm welcome to you. Uh, we are into the hundreds of episodes, uh, around 100, about 180 episodes we've released so far. So if you you enjoyed this uh, episode, which I know you will, uh, then there are plenty more uh, episodes for you to go and glean from. Uh, and if you've been following us for some time, uh, a warm welcome back to you. And uh, if you could give us a rating or a review on whatever uh, platform you're listening to this right now, that would be much appreciated. We, we've received tons of great feedback um, from the, our audience uh, as to the value that they're getting from these episodes. And the more ratings and reviews we get, uh, the more that that's going to continue to spread this podca- podcast out to those that uh, need and want to hear it. Uh, so in today's episode, I have the absolute privilege of sitting, to, sitting down with Katie Stephen. And now Katie is the head of transformation at BAPCOR and has a has been heavily involved in transformation work over the past 15 years, uh, working with many global organizations uh, throughout the world, many different countries. Very excited for this conversation. Katie, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Daniel. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So, Katie, uh, when we were talking just before we got started, you you mentioned something to me. You said 70% of transformation programs Fail uh, statistic from McKinsey, and I think that's uh, uh, that really stood out to me. Uh, and I think something that I wanted to kickstart this uh, our conversation off with, because uh, I think that's an alarming uh, stat. And I think I'm not sure how many people would be aware of that. I'm sure people out listening to this right now would be nodding their head, being like, "Yep," and I'm going through one of those at the moment, or I've just been through one of those. So. Why do you think it's such a, why do you think that that percentage is so high? 70%, that's quite quite alarming, I would say. Yeah, it's hugely alarming. And and thank you for bringing that back up. Um, I actually recently talk in, talked in Sydney, as you know, and, and also in Toronto at the OPEX weeks. Um, and they say that you should start your presentation with a with a jaw-dropping kind of a statistic. So that was that was up there, the number um on a slide, and it got people's attention straight away, right? So how do we not fall into that 70%? Um, it was even from about 2017, I believe it was either, you know, it's not a new statistic. Um, so I can only imagine that that number has increased. Um, and I actually did a bit of Googling a couple of months back to see how much money we were spending on transformation. Um, and digital transformation alone in 2023, it's estimated that we're spending 2.3 billion across the world. So it's a lot of dollars, 70%. Mm. Um, mm. So yeah, it's definitely worth paying attention to. Um, and for me, one of the main reasons why why we have such a huge number there is because we don't truly understand as organizations what it means to make the transformation program that we're delivering stick, right? So um, I don't know the statistics on this, but I would bet that uh, a huge proportion of those that eventually falling into the fail bucket um, you know, whether consultants were involved or, or not, they kind of, you know, they run as projects or programs and and they reach their endpoint and it's tick, tick, tick. We've done everything that we needed to do. We can close the project and then off we go. Um, and that's where it falls over. And and I always say, you know, I, I talk a lot about the difference between change versus transformation. Um, I've heard a, a million different definitions out there. I think that's that, you know, there are many that are right. The the one that resonates most with me is change fixes the past and transformation creates a brand new future. So fixes versus creates. If you think from a psychology perspective, it's it's a very different mindset um, for an individual and an organization to play. Um, 
And change is very, very necessary, but transformation is the more kind of sexy version. Um, and I'd always say that actually a, a true transformation program should never have an endpoint. Um, so, which makes it complicated when when you have external people involved and, and they want to kind of sign off something and then they can they can exit. But uh, for me, a, a true transformation is is self sustaining, and that's part of the, the the closure of the transformation is that it becomes self sustaining within BAU. Mm, mm. No, that's great. And I think that there are um, many examples of organizations that aren't continuously transforming. And in one generation, they're, you know, one of the world's largest organizations. And then the next generation, they're non-existent. Um, and there are quite a few examples out there. Um, what you obviously mentioned there, transformation needs to be continuous and needs to be ongoing. And that, that makes total sense. What can you break us that, that down a little bit more for us? Um, what are the key ingredients that are required for a, for a successful, I guess it's cult, a culture of transformation because it's, as you say, it needs to be embodied by the organization, by the people, by the, the hands and feet that are, that are part of it. And that's going to keep it sustainable. What, what are these key ingredients that we need to be aware of? Yeah. So love that question. Um, so for me, it's, you know, I, I love what you touched on around, the the nature of the world that we live in, right? Two generations ago, even heck, one generation ago, at the, at the beginning of my career, um, I, I read a great analogy in a book called Tomorrow Mind, which is written by Dr. Marty Seligman, who's the godfather of positive psychology. Um, and he talks about the skills that are needed in the future for, for thriving at work. Um, and he uses this great analogy and he says that in our parents' generation, um, people started their careers and Typically, they they worked at one organization, certainly within one industry, typically, and they could see where they were going. They were on this slow and steady journey from the start of their careers right until the very end. It was almost like they were in this steamship. Okay. Occasionally there were, you know, slight veers off course. You might change role or department or get a promotion, but by and large, you're on a steamship. You know where you're going. And then I guess, you know. 20, 30 years ago, when we really started to use technology, not in the way that we that we know it today, but when we started to, to get computers and, and send emails and things, um, that, that changed and people started traveling more and the world was all more accessible. And instead of steamships, it became more like sailboats. Okay. So you'd kind of start here and you'd you'd have one destination and maybe 10 or 15 years later, and then you'd reach that. And then and then you'd go to another place and, and so on and so on. And then, you know, fast forward to where we are today, since 2007, since we all got these things called iPhones in our pockets, um, since the convergence of technology, you know, new technologies are converging. That's what's really happening today in the last you know few years in particular, which is creating this exponential um, change. We're no longer on steamboats. We're no longer on on uh, you know um, sail, sailboats. We're we're white water rafting, and and that's the reality of of how we need to view our careers today. Um, but yet we're working in a workplace where we have such a broad mix of generations. We have people that are in their you know 60s, 70s that that started their career in a steamboat, and they're thinking, whoa, whoa, what's happening? I want stability. I don't really like change. This transformation word is is freaky. Um, and I want to know exactly where we're going. Whereas you've got, you know, young people coming in and they like change. They like excitement. They want to be challenged. They want fast moving. They want fast pace. They want different technologies, different channels. And, and for the first time ever, we're having to cope with a workplace. You know, one of the factors that's super important is, is recognizing that that variation that we have all in, in one melting pot called the organization mm. that we're working in. So for me, it's, it's first and foremost, you know, taking a step back and recognizing why is it so necessary today? A, because we have this, this mix of people. B, because it's so new. C, because of this exponential um, increase in, in technology, not just individual technology advancements, but the convergence of them now. You mm-hmm. know, nobody in um, the hotel industry thought of Airbnb. Nobody in the music industry thought of Spotify. Um, mm. Nobody in the banking industry thought of PayPal. These mm. are examples of, of truly transformative, brand new future, new way of thinking, convergence of technologies that just overnight 
you know, there was once this company called Blockbuster. <laughs> you know, they had no idea what, what was mm. happening when Netflix came along. Um, and so really just being able to understand um, that we need to that create these mindsets of transformation in order to make sure that we're here not only in 10 years time, but in the next kind of five years is key. Mm. So back to your question about what are the components um, I think it's really, really critical for me. It's it's a human thing, right? It's uh, the the end point is for an organization to create a culture of transformation, and I'm sure we're going to dive into that in in a bit more detail. Um, but you know, it's it's important to point out that a culture is something that needs to be cultivated, needs to be grown. It cannot be given to you by an external consultant. Um, I think external consultants are great. They absolutely have their value, but it's important to recognize what they can and can't do. Um, they can certainly help you to plant seeds for developing this culture. Um, but essentially, you know, th these, these cultures, these ways of being take time to develop. Um, mm. so for me, I talk to organizations about planting the seeds, the right seeds now for the future that we want to grow, um, and mindsets, behaviors, you know, things like resilience, super important. And there are some great organizations out there, um, that actually break down the, the components of these different kind of mindsets and behaviors that you want to, to create uh, on top of your usual kind of project management skills and change management skills. And, mm -hmm. you know, no longer organizations that I'm working with, no longer is it um, the right thing that we have a project management department or, or a change management department and only those people do change in project management. It's now very much the case where everybody needs to have these skills to, mm. to develop and to plant the right seeds. Yes. Yeah. And, and as you're saying, like you've got in the one organization, you've got people from all different ages, all different generations, um, even all different sort of cultural backgrounds, I guess, especially when you're working on a global perspective in a global organization that have different areas, how, how are we creating the future as, as a global entity in, in unison, um, working with one another. So we're not just little siloed area pockets all around the world, but that seems like such a huge challenge. <laughs> huge challenge. And, and honestly, Daniel, the, the positive psychology part of me is actually saying huge opportunity, hugely True. missed opportunity, right? Um, there's a great author called Rasmus Ankerson who talks about the, he's a, um, he was a professional footballer, but got injured and he studies the anthrop anthrop anthropology of um, talent. He's written a great book called The Goldman Effect. And he asked himself, he said, why is it that most of the world's top um, marathon runners come from this small village in Kenya. Why is it that most of the world's top sprinters come from Kingston and Jamaica? Um, you know, tennis players in in huge number in, in Russia, um, women golfers in South Korea. He noticed these patterns and he went off and he explored why. Um, and the the kind of he says that talent exists everywhere. Um, and it's actually the job of the coach. A, a good coach will recognize talent. A great coach will, will recognize potential talent and an exceptional coach will create the right environment in which potential talent can flourish. So today, you know, thinking about the skills that we need in the future as leaders, it's no longer our job to know everything. We do not need to be coding experts or, you know, or, or subject matter experts. That is not the skill that leaders of tomorrow requires. Yes, it helps. And it's very complimentary. Um, but but really, for me, the, the leaders of tomorrow are going to excel because they know how to create the environments to unleash the power of their team. And, you know, and the reality is when you've got that multi-generational, multi, you know, diverse, multi-skilled, you know, everyone has, it's no longer the standard, oh, I've got an English degree or I've got a maths degree. Like people have come from such beautifully colorful backgrounds and and for us you know the skill is being able to untap that um and i love yeah. to say to people when i start working with them how much untapped potential do you think you know you have in your team love to invite people to reflect on that because you know mm. not only in yourself how much untapped potential is in myself but in my team and if you aggregate that all up you know that's huge mm. and i think that with you know as you're saying you know, being able to have, having an English degree or a maths degree or 
or being qualified in those areas or, or, or you know, whatever it might be, obviously becomes less and less as technology continues to evolve and transform and adapt and supplements our, you know, the work that we're doing. And especially in this era of artificial intelligence, everything, everything's got artificial intelligence in it now, or, or we'll, we'll, we'll have that. Um, those skills are, are supported and supplemented by technology. So I guess the, um, the, the one area that we need to be, what I'm hearing, the area that we need to be drilling into and diving into further is, um, is understanding people, working with people, like the high, the, the whole psych, psychology element of transformation. How important is that yeah. to transformation? I think it's huge. You know, to your point, we can now Google anything that we want to, right? And and schools, some schools in some countries more than others have a long way to, to catch up on recognizing that. I think that, that um, and this is a whole other topic, but it's, a, it's um, amazing how, um, behind the get the curve, a lot of um, school examination systems still are on this aspect. But yeah, when we have these mini computers in our pockets and we can Google anything, it's no longer what we know. It's um, how we apply what we know and the questions that we ask. It's not mm. about having the answers because we can get the answers. It's about mm. asking the right questions. Mm. And if you just kind of pivot your mindset to Actually, you know, my my focus today is going to be on asking the right questions rather than my focus today is to show up and and I'm expected to know everything. You know, being curious, that is for me one of the the greatest um, superpowers of the future is this voracious sense of curiosity. Um, and uh, I love the word vujade. Um, so I don't know. Have you heard of it before, Daniel? I have not, no. So um, deja vu is when something uh, unfamiliar feels familiar. Vujade is inviting you to bring this sense of um, unfamiliarity to something that is very, very familiar. So you might turn up every week to the same meeting or speak to the same team every day. But can you do it with this new sense of curiosity rather than, mm. you know, your neural networks becoming so ingrained in what you're doing and just being on autopilot, which is what they're trained to do. And it's very great that we have that efficiency. Um, can we bring this sense of of newness, of curiosity to, to work that we do every day? Mm, that's fantastic. That's great. How do you, how do you lead people to have that curiosity I would imagine to to the point that we were discussing before the different generations, the younger generation, they're more open to change and excitement and being challenged and things like that. How do you bring people on this journey of curiosity, especially those that are maybe a bit resistant towards it or or it's just it's just um uh un, unusual for them or not un, unusual is probably not the right word, but a foreign to them. Foreign. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and look, there's there's no magic answer to this. It's it's a it's a constant challenge. And I think, you know, first of all, we have to recognize that we're dealing with lots of different types of people. Um, the reality is some people don't want to develop curiosity. If <laughs> they've never been a curious person their whole life, they just might not want to. They might just want to turn up at work, do their job, and go home. You know, and, and that's fine. And we're kind of getting into the realm. I can I can feel, you know, growth versus fixed mindsets is kind of um we're we're teasing at the edge of that. And quite often people um automatically assume, oh, we only want people with growth mindsets in our organization. You know, we want to get rid of all the fixed mindsets, people. And actually, people with fixed mindsets can add tremendous value. For me, the key is being able to recognize as a team leader, as, as, a, as a member of C-suite, recognizing who are the people in my team. You know, you can still get enormous, enormous value from, from people, um, even if they're not curious, but just understanding who you've got, reflecting. You know, I say that... Um, a good therapist never tells uh, individual patients, clients, anything that they didn't really know before. They just get them to see the world in a different way, get them to see themselves in a different way. I think that's our job as, as leaders in the transformation space and as leaders of organizations is to almost be like a therapist for businesses. Like you're not, you're not telling them anything that they don't know about what they do because they, you know, they're, they're, they're SMEs but it's just getting them to see what they do in a different way by asking the right questions, those kind of things. So 
first of all, I would say, you know, it, it's not a deal breaker if, if everybody is not curious, if, if everybody doesn't have curiosity, um, becoming aware of who does and who doesn't, becoming aware of um, the people in your team who have the big, biggest impact, the people in your organization, your team who have the biggest impact, um, the people who are the most negative and shining a light on those people, um, not in a, in a, in a uh, horrible way, but actually inviting them in, you know, 10 years ago when I started out and, um, I had my first role leading a global transformation program for global FMCG. Um, and they have, uh, product development supply chain teams based in Australia, China, Czech, UK, and USA. Um, and they'd grown very quickly through m and as most organizations that are here today have. Um, and the reality is the, the people in these different teams used to see each other as competitors because they worked for different organizations and, and their minds hadn't changed. They still saw each other as competitors. And, and my job, the, the kind of the problem statement was we've got product development teams all over the world. They're not talking in the same um, way um, and not just language, English versus Chinese, but, you know, different roles, different what's a priority project versus a strategic project. Um, and, and they're not using the same systems, the same processes, the same tooling, the same methodology. And, and, and you know, I said, look, I know nothing about product development. <laughs> I didn't at the time. I do know a lot more now. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know anything specifically about the industry that you're in, but but I, I can help you to, to change and, and I can facilitate that change. And um, I learned through failure. I always say you learn far more through failure than you, than you do through success. And that's certainly been the case for my career. Um, I learned through trial and error that, you know, my immediate instinct was, um, at the beginning of my career to shy away from the people that would, that would be negative. Katie, you seem really nice, but you know, we've had 10 of you in before. And the reality is you're just not, we're not going to change. You know, people have tried this a million times. We've had consultants, we've had firms, we've tried X, Y, and Z, you know, you seem lovely, but it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, it, now today, what I do with it, I used to run away from those people. And go, oh, please don't, don't let, let me have to speak to Tim. Um, now I, I invite those people in. You know, I, I shine a light on them. I, I really lean into that um, and say, you know, that's fascinating. Please tell me more. Tell me, tell me why you think this won't work. Tell me what you think are the biggest blockers. And if I can, if if you're in the situation to do, I would strongly recommend that you then actually invite those people to be part of the project team, whether that's in a, in a, um, you know, whatever capacity it is as a champion or as an actual kind of um, owner of a work stream or what have you, however your project is structured, but inviting them to be part of it and, and inviting is key rather than mandating. You don't want to, the last thing you want to do is phone up their boss and say, I need this person on my team. Cause these people typically don't <laughs> like being told what to do, but yes. they do love to be invited to be part of things, you know? So, so actually really listening to those people because mm -hmm. They have the the knowledge um, mm. that can unlock all the mm. reasons why you're you're going to to fail. Mm, yeah, and and huge amount of being um, opportunity there to leverage what they do know. You know, so I think being able to create a culture or an environment where people do feel like they're important, their opinion is valued, um, where they they they're free to share instead of a culture where people aren't bringing stuff to the surface out of fear that, you know, they're not hitting certain measures or metrics or, you know, something isn't working how it should have been working or, or whatever it might be. Um, that could really squash that sort of culture of transformation and innovation, I'd imagine, yeah. whereas being able to leverage these people, invite them in, bring them on that journey, and then as changes do pl take place, I would imagine that the the ownership there, you're so much further ahead when yeah. you've involved them in the journey than than otherwise. Yeah, so much more impactful. And and also to your point, even just giving people, you know, nine times out of ten, these people just, um, their fear is that they won't be listened to, that they won't mm. be heard. They mm. just want to be listened to, you know. Mm. And, and sometimes we can't solve the problems. And sometimes, you know, it's like actually, do you know, you're right. That is a problem. And that is a reason why, you know, we're going to come into some challenges and we're going not, but, and we're going to, to continue anyway. And, and, you know, and we can do X, Y, and Z, you know, we can do these risk pre-mortems and all of these things. But quite often I find suddenly if you, if you give people the opportunity to voice, tell me all the reasons why this won't work, you mm. know, because change is scary. 
Um, mm. and, and until we make it the norm to talk, you know, again, kind of um, thinking about what this culture looks like, a, a, a truly kind of transformative culture, um, failure isn't something to be scared of. Mm. Uh, failure is something that's embraced and it's celebrated mm. and we learn from it. And, mm. and it's about, you know, you try, you fail, you learn, you adapt. You try, you fail, you learn and you adapt. Most organizations are tripping over themselves at, at the starting block. They're not even trying because mm. they're scared of getting it mm. wrong, right? Yes. And so not only do we want to make it safe for people to try, learn, fail, learn, adapt, we want to really expedite the speed at which that process happens because that's where transformation comes alive is, is, yes. is the, 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 the pace at which you as a team, not just individuals, but you and as a team. And, and to do that, you need to, you need to form networks over hierarchies. So I'd say that's another kind of key attribute of a, of a culture is that you have, you know, underneath your culture, you have high performing teams or high impact teams where talking mm. about failure is, is safe and celebrated and welcome. Mm. Um, and, and, um, teams where, and, and, and underneath those teams, you have, um, individuals that, are, that have these, these personal behavioral attributes. Mm. Um, and I'd say within those teams as well, not only is, is talking about failure, something that they, um, kind of, uh, learn from and embrace, um, it's much more about creating networks rather than hierarchies, you know, kind of mm. yesterday hierarchies was yesterday, you being the single bottleneck at the top of a, an organizational structure. Yes, we still need organizational structures and I don't imagine they're going to go, go anywhere. Mm. Um, and nor should they, but it's really about creating teams that are networks, um, over hierarchies, um, and, and connecting those dots and, and, um, I don't remember the the name. There's a, a great sports psychologist called Jamil Qureshi, and he always says that success is joining previously unjoined dots. That's the new yes. definition of success is joining the dots. And, and that doesn't always have to be in one direction. It can be across the way, horizontal, vertical, in, in every which direction, right? But it's joining two previously unjoined, unjoined dots. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there are many examples out there of, of innovations that have come from these Type, sorts of teams that you're describing here, um, where it has come more from, I guess, more of a, a bottom up sort of approach in, in a sense, in the way that this, you know, these um, organizations have created environments and cultures for people and individuals and teams to come up with various ideas and innovations. And, and, and I'm sure, um, I only know of a handful of examples off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's many examples. Like I think Google Maps is one where um, these huge mega global organizations with a wide range of products and some of the most popular products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, um, what start, like came from a an incubator team individual within an organization that was given the freedom to innovate and to create. And that product then, you know, was, was prioritized and given, given the hands and feet required to make it flourish into what it is today. Um, and, and that's, you know, some of these world sort of, um, renowned products that we all use that they didn't come from the the founder or the ceo they came from the the network of people yeah, within totally I, th I think it was actually um i didn't know it was google maps but i knew that it was google google itself won the race to being the world's uh, biggest search engine um back you know it must have been and i'm going to get the date wrong but whenever that was um you know they weren't always the top of the race we forget that there were other competitors out there um and my understanding is i read the story that that google um cracked cracked the nut um because somebody senior had written up the problem that they were facing the reason that they couldn't um unlock the the search engine capability fully They'd written down the problem statement and stuck it on the office um, a kitchen, kind of the canteen, one of the cupboard walls, um, and just some kind of you know um, very junior 
um, I think it was a code developer, um, came into the kitchen um, and and saw that problem and just thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a crack at this. And then over the weekend managed to solve that problem. And that then led to a chain of events, which enabled Google to, to be where it is today. So, you know, yeah, exactly to your point, creating that space where we share, you know, we're not afraid to say, hey guys, I've got a problem. I need help. You know? Yes, yes, I, yes. I so rarely see that. And especially the more senior you go. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the more senior you go, the more people have this very um, uh, toxic um, um, mindset that I, I have to know everything. I cannot be seen to, to not know in front yeah. of my team and in front of my peers. You know, my job is to know everything. Yeah. And, and it's toxic for the reason that it just it simply stops that individual, that team, that organization moving forward and unleashing their full potential. If we totally. could just be a bit more vulnerable and have the safe space to do that and say, I need help. That yeah. would be great. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And um, one one other example that comes to mind is um, of creating an environment for sort of ideation um, type work. And, and I love this one, and I think it can be applied across many different areas, but it's the, the whole Airbnb um, story and, and the founders, you know, they sat down with their team one day, and I don't know how big the, the organisation was, but they said to their team, guys, like, we need to we need to make we need to set ourselves apart from all of the other accommodation options out there or, 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 or what's, I guess, the traditional way that people would search and find accommodation and so they went on this bit of an exercise where they they started with well what's what's a five star experience let's let's talk for a moment about what we feel like a five star airbnb experience would be like and then so everyone shared their ideas and they were jotting down all of the the great ideas that come into the table and then once that was done they said let's talk about a six star experience. What would a six star experience be? So even though they felt like they exhausted all of the five star, it, it, they challenged the, the the people in the room to let's take it up a notch. And they kept doing that until they got to like a 10 star experience where, and, and at this point it's, you know, it's, you know, getting to the levels of sort of unrealistic. I think, I think at 10 star experience, the story goes that you would land at an airport in your private jet and you would hop off and there'd be an elephant there for you to jump onto the back of, and there'd be a parade through the main street leading you all the way to your, I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Leading your way all the way to to your accommodation. And Elon, Elon Musk is there to, with it, with a, a rocket to take you to them, like, you know, just crazy. But, but I think what that exercise does is forces people to, think outside the box because when you think or when you when you start with the five star experience you you're probably your thinking is still probably somewhat limited because you're thinking in the realms of what's realistic and what's the reali- possible the reality of today yeah that's the right of today yeah and, exactly. and going back to what we said at the beginning around the change versus transformation when you're stuck in that box you're only ever going to do incremental changes because you mm. cannot see anything else Mm-hmm. You have to to create that space, that safety, that psychological safety, that that team network to, to where you can actually sit down and dream big. You know, I mm-hmm. always say to people, our jobs here is to imagine imagination, another mm-hmm. very underrated skill in the workplace. We think imagination mm-hmm. and play is just for kids. There are so many studies coming out on the value of of imagination yes. in your workforce. Um, and yes. it's only when you can take yourself out of that that box of change that you can lift your head up and get into that transformation space. I love that story. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that about Airbnb. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. And and there's a full sort of 60 minute YouTube of that where he he sort of breaks it down and, and walks walks the you know the listeners through it, which is quite fascinating. Fascinating. But Katie, I just want to thank you for sitting down. Uh, with us today, with my, myself today, um, I'm sure that our audience has gleaned a lot from this conversation. I certainly have, and and it's uh, it's a very exciting topic, or I find it very exciting at least. And I think it's something that a lot of organisations need to uh, hear more about. And obviously, in a 30 minute conversation, we're not you know solving all of the world's problems in in this episode, but 
if if this uh, conversation can just spark the interest of at least one person out there, um, which I'm sure it will, um, to be able to um, explore this this further and to ask more questions internally, and if they're in a leadership position of some description, creating that that open sort of transparent uh, culture and environment to encourage ideas and people to sort of come to the table. Then I think um, we've done uh, it's a good it's a job well done. Uh, but I just want to thank you for sitting down with me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. Pleasure's mine as well. Thank you. 